Why do you think it took so long for for people to talk about mental health in academia? I mean, it's uh, you know you're an academic, you've been in the university, and you've been also sort of following this topic for a long time. But we've only started to hear about mental challenges in academia in, in the past a few years, and that's mainly thanks to you know, the, the recent surveys, which shows how pervasive is the problem mm -hmm. is, you know, showing that 30 to 35 to 40 percent of the students suffer from some sort of mental health uh, illness or a challenge. But why did it take so long? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's taken so long because those ideals of uh, conformity, normality and uh, autonomy and independence are just so 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 much ingrained in our history. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago uh, in, you know, where, where I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, uh, that I would have been embarrassed to spend more than a few nights at my parents' house because it would have infantilized me or seen me as somehow dependent. And um, I think that we are uh, beginning to uh, change all of the contours of our social relationships, whether it has to do with um, gay marriage or with um, neurodiversity, uh, group living situations. We're beginning to, to understand that independence is an illusion and a damaging one, and that to be human is actually to be dependent mm -hmm. on others. And so uh, I feel like we're on the right course, but we could easily slip back. You know, one of the things that this book argues is that the history of mental illness stigma is a roller coaster, that the stigma of mental illness ebbs and flows based on social and historical contexts. Right now, we happen to be in a particular context, and very specifically the pandemic, where uh, emotional struggles are increasingly normalized, um, expected, reasonable within the context of all of the stresses and strains of the pandemic. But once the pandemic is over, we could recede into back into a time where people would say, well, you have no reason to be suffering now. The pandemic's over, in which case it becomes harder and harder to disclose and harder and harder to get treatment. So if you, if you were to be called by the president of your university in terms of advising on, on, on a mental health strategy for academic institutions or you know, what are sort of the top two or three things that could be done uh, to help change the culture and, and, and create a cultural environment where people feel safe and uh, where people feel that they're not they're part of that continuum, you know? They're, they're different, but they're not abnormal and where they're cared for. One thing I would wanna make sure of is that my institution expand the kinds of accommodations that are available for people. Um, the, the, the colleges and universities or the sections of universities that in my experience often have uh, the least successful mental health care outreach um, are those um, where the students feel that they shouldn't receive accommodations and that to do so is somehow demeaning or stigmatizing. In fact, we used to have a rule, I don't know if we still do, that if a student was allowed to use a laptop in class because they had a disability, that everyone in the class had to be able to use a laptop because otherwise the student with the laptop would be publicly observable, identified, outed mm -hmm. as someone with a disability. Uh, that's not a healthy way of, of going about um, disabilities or mental illnesses in the classroom. Um, we need to provide the kinds of accommodations that make sure the people are um, um, aware that of, of just how prevalent it is. When we tell people who, who really could benefit from an accommodation, just how many students receive accommodations, they are so comforted by that. They know they're not uh, alone. They know they're not alone, but you know, they go to a counseling session and they're by themselves in a waiting room or something, and they don't see the, the big 
the, the big picture. We have to make sure that they know that, that they're not alone. Now I should say, I see a pretty, I, I see a distinctive population because I teach classes on culture and mental health. So the people who take my classes are probably much more, you know, open my classes select for that. Um, but we are seeing changes across the board. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, with numbers and making sure of the case. The other thing I would tell universities to do is to not be afraid that they are going to create mental illnesses by making people aware of the symptoms. I tell the story in the book of Stanford University's efforts to um, address eating disorders among uh, uh, college women, Stanford. And they found that the more that women learned about uh, eating disorders, the more eating disorder symptoms they reported. Mm -hmm. And the school was upset. Oh my gosh, we're, we're creating eating disorders. In fact, they were not. What they were doing was they were making people aware of symptoms that they already had, but which they hadn't seen as organized into a concept of eating disorders and they had not reported. And now they were getting care. So when we see these greater numbers, what we see is they're getting greater care. It's not that they're somehow creating more mental illnesses. And this is something that the US military has had to tackle as well. And I quote a famous general in the book by saying, we don't want any psychiatrists in the army making our boys sick. Do you think that uh, some sort of the, the lack of quantitative assessment of the impact of mental health in, in academia, for example, is, is a reason, is one of the reasons behind the lack of urgency? I mean, if you look at the banking sectors and areas where people realize that, you know, the, there is an economic cost for, for people suffering, but in, in academia, there has not been that careful evaluation in terms of if people who are suffering, you have a high percentage of people who are suffering from mental health, be it students, or staff, or faculty, and frequently, you know, the staff and faculty are sort of ignored, then the impact on the mission of the institution, but also the economical impact on the institution, that type of work and research has not been done. And I was wondering whether this could contribute to this lack of urgency to tackle this issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're right uh, that we don't have enough uh, epidemiologic studies of the prevalence of mental health problems in um, among academic professionals. Um, we also don't have services. So, you know, if, if we were at my university, a university in which we all had to do physical labor, lifting heavy things, we would have checkups all the time on our backs, our muscles, our legs. We'd have all kinds of services to help us with our physical problems. Uh, and here we are in a profession where it's all about our minds. And yet we don't have much in the area of taking care of our mental health. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are afraid that we'll be seen as somehow deficient. Um, we're so, so academia, and I can't speak for academia in your setting, but here it's just so competitive. Yes. And um, PhD students, you know, they may love their work, but they just don't know, will they ever get a job in academia or not? Um, and it's, um, it's, it's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And I've had students who have told me that it's taken them two years or three years for them to tell me that they suffer from serious bouts of depression because they thought I wouldn't want to be on their committee or I want, wouldn't want to um, recommend them for a job. I think one aspect we usually fail to, to, to grasp is that in an academic institution or for in any institution for that matter, the lives of the people within that institution are interconnected. You know, in, in academia, the life of the students to the staff, to the faculty, and therefore it's not simple to try to address the problem by tackling only one group. And I think Sure. normalizing the conversation within the institution where people are all levels very comfortable in sharing and opening up and sharing their own vulnerability 
will will go a long way in, in, in you know if the students realize that they're not alone right it's all the faculty experience the same type of stress and right. mental health challenges i think that could help yeah i mean i think one thing too is that students uh, are kind of uh, always encouraged to ask for help uh professors aren't um in fact i mean i remember when i've had tragedies in my life um I have not asked people to take a class for me or teach for me that week. I, we don't ask people to, we don't delegate. We don't ask people to help us. Um, we just try to tough it out. And it's also um, rare that superiors take the time to check on those things. Exactly. You know, because, and they're, you know, that's not to put the blame on anybody, but because they're also, they themselves yeah. are in this cycle of me. I mean, in my, on my, my colleagues, many of them have experienced tragedies in the last two years. None of them has asked anybody to, to help them. I mean, I would certainly help if somebody asked me, but, and it's not that they're not asking me, they're not asking anybody. Yeah.